Oh, hi, this is Margaret Ulimount Benson. We're honored today to be guests on Cafe Native Americana. In the late, in the mid 80s or in the late 70s, <laughs> I, I got this guy. This, I found this in the back of a car I bought. It was a 67 Newport. It was hit by a bear, so it had bear power. And it has magical power, and it kind of dials up off the grid. Uh, Native Americana in Canada, I call it Native Canadiana. Um, music and, and stories, and you guys came on the, on, the, on the dial today. It's like a seashell. If you put it to your ear, you'll hear the ocean. But this, you'll hear... You guys, so tell us oh, about tell, tell us who you are, okay? Like, welcome to the cafe, to the audio cafe, and give the listeners a little bit of um, a welcome. Uh, okay, well, hello, everybody. <laughs> Never stop having hope, but that's uh, the only way to help yourself, too. <laughs> Well, uh, Buju and McWitch for having us. So um, I'm Christy, and this is my children's grandmother, Margaret, also known as Uliman, is her traditional name. And we're streaming in today from the territory of the Daneza in uh, northeastern British Columbia. Yeah, how are you guys holding out? How are you doing, Margaret? I'm doing fairly good. I haven't, I had some health problems, but I'm overcoming them. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing much better than I thought. I never thought I'd live to be this age, but a uh, surprise. <laughs> well, I'm, eight, I'm 83, going on to 84. <laughs> what, an, what an honored guest here today. How about you, Christy? How are you holding up with your family? Oh, good. I, I actually really enjoy spending a lot of time with my children. So I'm, I'm definitely not one of those parents that can't wait for my kids to go back to school. We've, we've been having a lot of fun. So um, yeah, holding up good. I never expected to do so many dishes in my life. But uh, other than that, yeah, it's been good. Well, why I asked you to come on the cafe today is, well, we've done co some collaboration, which we'll tell the listeners and the viewers they will be able to see. But you, you two have been going all across of Canada and healing people through the reconciliation movement, if that's what we want to call it, but just getting out there and, and loving people. Tell us about it. Yeah, well, so we've worked on four children's books together, and the most well-known is Fatty Legs, which has its 10th anniversary this year, actually. It's been 10 years, and it's about when Margaret went to residential school. Margaret's in Avalok from the very high Western Arctic, and when she was eight years old, she went to residential school and she got stuck there for two years. And when she was there, one of the really mean nuns made her wear these bright red stockings and um, all the children laughed at her and they teased her and they called her fatty legs. So one day when we were driving to town, Margaret told me the story of how she got rid of these stockings, which I thought was um, a really fantastic story. It was, um, I was raised by a residential school survivor in, in a community with lots of people who went to residential school. And, Nobody ever really talked about it, but you knew something really bad had happened um, when they were children. So Margaret's story was the first story I had actually heard about residential school where a child had agency and had one up the nuns. And I just thought it was great. I thought it was a great opportunity to make Margaret um, hold her up as a hero for my children so that they could be really proud of their own indigeneity. And so I said, Margaret, please let me write this story as a book. And what did you say, Margaret? I said, no, I don't want you to write about me. And why didn't you want me to write about you? I didn't want my grandchildren to know I was naughty at one time. <laughs> now we're four books later. They're translated into French and Korean. Um, we've been all over Canada, uh, a little bit in the U.S. We've been to Havana. Um, there's a musical about Margaret's life now, There's um, which uh, stars Serene Carson Fox and... Uh, there's uh, the music video that uh, we have with you for Say Say Your Name, um, which features Margaret and some of her uh, archive uh, photos. So um, she's come a long ways from not wanting anybody to know what she did with her stockings. Well, it's such a, a, a story of hope and triumph and perseverance, and it's a wonderful light for the world, you know. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you for... Oh, you're welcome. I was, at first I didn't like, 
being exposed, I didn't want to be in a public eye. <laughs> but uh, I, I, when I found out that it was helping the others, uh, they used to be students of the residential school and they had, when they hear somebody else talking about it, well, they open up. And the, uh, they like my, the children of the residential school uh, people. They like the second book best a lot because it reflects on how uh, how they can get out of, uh, you know, they never understood why their parents were different to them and they were always worried about something and the kids didn't know what. And so it helped. And a lot of them come by and tell me that they're so happy they, that that second book was written and it helps them a lot to understand a lot of things. And the second book actually has a connection with Keith because, um, so the second book is A Stranger at Home and it talks about when Margaret went home and had to fit back into her culture again. She couldn't speak the language anymore. She couldn't stomach the food. And it was actually, um, that book was written right after you sent me a very early uh, recording of Say Your Name. And that's when I, I sat down and did a marathon write, and we went we went to work again on another book. And, and so I know more things are are happening, but one of the beautiful things that happened in this whole thing was you're going out and talking to people, and holding their hands and praying for them and physical things. T tell me a little bit about that. Um, so when we go to classrooms, actually, um, well, often we're not in a classroom, we're in an auditorium, and there could be 500 kids in the auditorium, and Margaret just has this beautiful grandmother vibe, so quite often it will take a long time to get all those students out of the auditorium to get the next group in, because even the older students will do this, they all have to hug Margaret on the way out. So it's, it's really beautiful, and maybe some of those children don't have a grandmother in their lives, or they don't have anybody who hugs them. So for them to be able to hug their hero is a really big deal. She's she's very giving that way. Margaret, do you like going out in the public with the children and teaching in the classrooms? Oh, I love being with the the children, and and they're so receptive when the teachers, you know, get them to read the book. And they want to know because they tell the students that I'm still alive. So they get really kind of emotional at times. And I, I think it's fantastic too that Margaret is able to be a hero for especially young Indigenous girls who don't see accurate reflections of themselves very often. And here's this girl who maybe didn't get along so well with her teachers, and but she was really smart and had a lot of heart and really went on. I mean, she became a, a famous author and a, a famous person. And it's really important, I think, um, for children to see that. I know that it's really important to my daughters to be able to see reflections of themselves. Chrissy, talk about this distorted image that young women receive. Um, like po Pocahontas, I can recall my daughter being very little. I think she was three or four when she um, encountered Pocahontas and she was quite upset. She said, how come Pocahontas doesn't get any clothes when all the other, uh, all the other princesses get clothes? And um, so I don't think that there's a lot of accurate reflections. There's a lot of stereotypes out there. Um, and there's definitely um, a lot more um, books and movies and stuff that are coming out with accurate reflections. But I think when we started 10 years ago, well, actually we started writing 12 years ago, um, when my children were quite young, I was really struggling to find anything that, that showed them something accurate of themselves. And, and that's really where Fatty Lakes came from. It started from me bugging Margaret all the time to tell me her stories about hunting wolves and polar bears and, and all the cool things that went with um, being brought up in a valley so that I could tell my kids and that they, and that they would hear their grandmother tell these stories and then they'd be proud. Um, I saw my, my Cree step siblings not be very proud of being Cree and it always really bothered me and I didn't want my children to, to grow up that way. I want it to be if somebody says something racist to them, which my, my son's starting to encounter a lot now, I want them to be able to say, but do you know who my people are? Do you know where I come from? And, and be able to brush that off. That's right. Uh, thank you for reflecting you know, upon this, um, I think people don't really think about things like this as critically and deeply. And uh, Margaret, when you're working with the students, uh, 
Is there a favorite story you like to tell them? Well, uh, <laughs> there's kind of, I think they uh, I'm not thinking very well because I got up too early this morning. <laughs> do, do, you well, share, do, do you want to share the story? Um, we use it as an example um, to talk about sort of the, the culture shock of a new country setting itself on top of your country. Margaret, did you want to talk about when you went back to school shopping and what happened when you got to the school? Like when your mom took you to the Hudson's Bay? Oh, oh yeah. The, I, this was when I didn't know any English at all, and I was going to school. Mom was going to drop me off, and uh, she went shopping. And we both didn't know how to read, but we also buy things just by looking at them. And she, we were going to go to the clerk, and uh, she said, Oh, we got to get you a toothbrush and toothpaste. So we got that. And, and she dropped me off at the school and uh, in the morning I was just following whatever the girls were doing because I couldn't understand anything, any language. And I seen they were starting to brush their teeth and I thought to myself, I got one of those. So I took my toothbrush out and put the toothpaste on and when I put it in my mouth, it was terrible. It was shaving cream. <laughs> 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 everybody, everybody laughed how how gross that would be to, to brush your teeth with shaving cream but then i explained um to the students that that margaret's mom was an Inavalik woman who spoke Inavalukta and, and lived in Inavalawit territory there was no reason she should have been able to read or understand english and i, I asked students how many have been to another country or um often when we're in a class children have come from another country i can ask them how many of you started first day of school without speaking english and then I explained that's them going to a different country. In Margaret's case, a different country came and set itself, uh, the country of Canada set itself on top of the Inavaluate territory. You know, I think, um, how is um, this isolation, Margaret? Are you alone in your apartment? Do you get any visitors? I know uh, you're close uh, yes, to your grandchildren. I, I ended up, uh, my son got me an apartment because I live quite a few miles out of town. And uh, I keep getting sick, and so he, him and his brother, they moved me into this apartment, and I didn't like it at all because I wanted to stay at the farm. But when you have poor health, and it takes 20 minutes to get there, and then 20 minutes to get out of there, so when I had to go to the hospital twice in one month, I, I stopped. Uh, trying to stay at home <laughs> but it's it's good once you get used to it it's quiet and it's uh, uh it's really nice because everybody leaves each other in their their private uh rooms and uh lately my son has bought me a, some tickets to go to the, they have a cafeteria and i never ever went there and he said well you go to start walking around a bit and I thought well don't like eating in cafeteria but I thought well I'll give it a try and I, I got to liking it they they cook very good meals and they're just made for older people <laughs> but very delicious they the I think farm all farm ladies there when they don't have anybody else they start cooking and oh, they just cook everything like they did when they had a big families. So Margaret, um, her, her and it's really nice. <laughs> her, her building is actually quarantined, but her son Lyle that she was talking about, he drops off meals to her sometimes too for supper. I'll drop off meals, but it's sort of we just see each other through the glass and no hugs or anything like that. So that's been a little bit hard. Protecting our elders, it's the same thing down here. And, you know, we're all kind of, the native communities are staying and protecting our elders, our treasures. And um, so that's kind of why we're visiting with you today too, Margaret, to send you love and-, and uh, Oh, thank you. That really, uh, I, I couldn't hardly believe it. And I thought, well, I'm not gonna try and, I'm gonna get up early and I don't just sleep the morning. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, I, I still do a lot of sewing. And uh, I'm not as fast as I used to when I bead, do beadwork, but it's still there. <laughs> That's yeah, good. All yeah. the healing work that you guys are doing. I think it's kind of an odd thing down here why so many Native people are predisposed for their health because of these boarding schools and because of these residential schools. It, 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 it made affect. Any comment on that, Christy? Yeah. Um, well, overall, I mean, they, there's so much research um, from people like Dr. Gabor Mate into the physiological or health effects of trauma in childhood, but even taking on uh, things like, as you've talked about before, oppression food, having oppression food introduced as, as contributes so much to diabetes and so many other health issues. Um, you know, I, I love that Margaret, she had a really hard time when she went home stomaching her traditional food anymore, but now she loves it. If she can get her hands on muktuk or um, any of her country foods, she just, she has a great feast. So. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, we see a lot of, of follow. Uh, one of the things that we see here, and I'm sure it's the same there, is the, uh, the hoop broken between men and women because um, the, the segregation between genders at the schools and the, the notion that women were, were bad and they were evil and needed to be punished and all these things that men were raised with. That wasn't traditional, but we've seen that even go intergenerational now um, in some communities. I'm really happy to see such a resurgence, at least where we're at, um, in ceremonies, though, uh, to work in and uh, decolonize all of that and, and bring back healing and repair the hoop again. There's um, some of the, the healing and things that have to be done. And I think the healing in music is done in the present tense, you know, mm -hmm. by getting out there and singing the songs. And it's a weird kind of thing that even this little portal, it can bring intention, you know, like of, of songs and things like that. I always, I always like the way that um, you've referred to your concerts as a modern day ritual. Uh, you know what, Christy, we've got to get you to write a little bit for this series. Um, I'm going to just bring you sing you a little chorus today. But one thing about Zoom, it cancels out guitar and if I'm singing and playing guitar. So there's a word similance. Blood red circle on the cool dark ground. Rain come falling down. Church was wide open. I can hear the organ sound, but the congregation is gone. My city of ruins. My city of ruins. Uh, see what I mean? It kind of sometimes it'll sound like a computer generated thing, but I wanted to sing to you guys. I know you guys are, are musicians. I know, Christy, you sing. Do you got your guitar there at all? No, I, I don't play guitar. I drum a little bit, but uh, I, I, yeah, I, I know some Sundance songs. <laughs> no, I, I know. I just put it, I'm just giving you a spot because I know you sing well. And I oh, know Margaret dances well. And we could have her do a little dance there. <laughs> <laughs> How about anything? Um, you see any future ways? Is there school opening up there? Are they going to start to uh, um, any way that you guys are going to do any more workshops or anything? We've, we've continued to do workshops. We've been, Margaret's gotten very good um, at Zoom uh, over the past couple months. So we've continued to meet with classes online. Um, we should be having a big event coming up in, uh, I think, June 11th with the Vancouver Maritime Museum. That will probably be an open Zoom for anybody to join in. And uh, schools have, they're supposed to be opening June 1st here in the province of BC. It's voluntar voluntary. I don't know how many people are actually going to send their children back to school. And in the fall, I guess we'll have to see. But I think right now with Margaret being an elder, we're, we're looking to just moving to online platform. Like you said, we got to protect our elders. So um, as much as Margaret loves traveling and being in the classroom, I think we're going to probably have to look more at, at doing things like Zoom. We had the 
the great pleasure of having Keith uh, sing a song about uh, our book, and it was wonderful. And everyone liked it. This is the Say Your Name video inspired by the truth and the song inspired by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. This video features the stories of Margaret Uliman and her photographs from uh, from Fatty Legs and from Stranger at Home. The illustrations are done by Liz Amini Holmes, who illustrated Fatty Legs and a Stranger at Home. Last words, any comments you'd like to um, give some hope to the people? <clears throat> the, I know uh, the people up north, I have been there in July. They still like your music. <laughs> yeah, and uh, they're very selective. Uh, they don't like the songs that are banging away and everything, but they like words. <laughs> and, and, uh, person's uh, song, song, the singer. <laughs> I would say one thing that you can take away from, from Margaret's story, whether um, being Indigenous or not, is that she went through a really tough time for two, two years. She was stuck 
at the school and couldn't even communicate with her family and really just had to try and find that strength inside. And I know a lot of young people are going through a really tough time right now. They're separated from their friends and, and maybe um, their elders, like my children being separated from Margaret right now. Um, but you can make it through that. And sometimes you go through some really tough times. You might even feel really bad or, or feel ashamed about some of the things you've been through. But if, if you look at Margaret, she's always turned that into, into her own medicine and her own power. If you just, just hang on long enough and, and stay strong in your spirit, you can get through it. Uh, um, how do we get a hold of you um, if you, we wanted to find out more? Yeah, so the easiest way to get a hold of us is um, a lot of people use Facebook Messenger, and it's easy because my name is exactly the same as how it's on the book cover of Fatty Legs or any of our books. So it's Christy Jordan Fenton. And then um, Margaret and I live in each other's back pockets, even being separated. So I can always get messages to her. We have a Facebook page that's called Fatty Legs. And on Instagram, we're uh, Christy underscore and underscore Margaret Uliman. And um, it's a very youth friendly Instagram page that uh, children would probably enjoy as well. Throw up different pictures of Margaret. <laughs> I should mention too that that song, um, when we go into classrooms or into auditoriums, we play the, the music video and that song sort of to, to set the tone and, and get the children ready to listen. And then we play it again at the end because we shared a lot of heaviness with them and it, it brings them back to that place of love and, and feeling good again. It's like our, um, our opening and closing prayer, that song. But it's, it's you, you are the priestesses and you are the ones who know how to administrate the medicine. So miigwech. Miigwech. you coming on the cafe today and ordered up a, a cafe native americano you know it's like the difference is christy and margaret is you got a, like a regular americano but you got like a whipped cream and they haven't put a feather on there you know feather <laughs> design or a chief headdress or something like that you know um yeah, up, but up here I, we drink our version is chaga <laughs> yeah